Uh, we are doing this class after a little while because of various things that are happening. The election on one side and various other things. Uh, floods in Kerala. So many things and therefore we could not do this before. Uh, but I hope all of you are preparing very earnestly and uh, we can catch up with international affairs. Uh, just a few introduction, a bit of an introduction before we go on to the Iran situation. Uh, if you look back at the new, new century, that is the 21st century, uh, we find certain things which are rather different from what used to happen in the 20th century. Uh, because wars were there even before, crisis was there, there, would also, there were also terrorism, etc. before, uh, financial situation. Many things have happened in the before also. But since uh, 2000, uh, in 2024, uh, we find certain uh, trends which are very disturbing. Uh, because the wars we started even in 2022 have not ended. And there is no sign of any end. Mostly wars end very quickly in a ceasefire and the negotiations continue, UN operation, etc. etc. There is some kind of a pattern in the crisis situations in the past. But this century from 2021 onwards, what things have happened and they don't seem to disappear. Uh, this is true about the first, most biggest international crisis which was the 9-11, uh, still is alive. Because even after 30 years of war by the Americans in Afghanistan, terrorism has not been eliminated. In fact, if anything, it has spread to other parts of the world. So 9-11 is still a terror uh, situation, which we all remember. The, it is reflected in all our lives because uh, everyone is very scared when you get onto a plane or go anywhere, whether terrorism will pursue you. And uh, that fear is there, and therefore the fear that was created by the 9-11 uh, seems to persist, and you don't see any, any relief from that. Then the second is the economic crisis of 2007-2008, also is there with us, even though the, the crisis has uh, vanished and the economies are coming back to normal, but still the situation is still serious in many, many countries of the world. Prosperity there is, but this prosperity is not uh, well shared by others. And uh, in that sense, the economic crisis has not gone. The pandemic, yes, thank God, it is over, we think. Uh, but at the same time, there are signs that uh, this is still around in the world. We just recently heard that in September, there are very many cases of uh, COVID-19 even though probably there were no deaths and uh, the virus is uh, mutating. and So the fear from that is also not gone. Then look at the Ukraine-Russia war. Uh, two, two years have passed and there is no let up. There is no ceasefire even. In all these cases, the parties concerned are not even interested in ceasefire. This is again a new new trend in international affairs. And uh, then came the uh, Palestine uh, situation, the Gaza war by Israel, beyond all proportion and proportion of uh, the attack by Hamas. Uh, they are uh, virtually eliminating the Palestinians and taking over Gaza. So all these have had its impact on international relations. And so whatever we see around us today, when you read newspapers or follow, uh, various developments, you will be bewildered by this as to why there is no end to many of these things. So it is in this context that we have to see of what is happening in the world today. So the most uh, surprising and uh, unexpected development was the recent uh, Iranian attack on Israel, uh, which nobody anticipated. Uh, but uh, fortunately, Israel did not react immediately, and otherwise there would have been a bigger war. And the United States also controlled the Israeli reaction to this. And uh, therefore, um, uh, Iran attacked and Israel attacked, and uh, the chapter seems to have been closed because nobody is interested in widening the, widening the war. And the Americans have put their foot down both towards Israel as well as towards Iran. 
that uh, such uh, conflict should not arise now. Palestine is bad enough, and uh, more than 35,000 people have died. And the present attack on Rafah is very serious. These are one million refugees in a, in a small area. And uh, if you attack them, then what happens to so many lives? And Israel is thinking that as far as they are concerned, the biggest situation is that the Israeli hostages in uh, uh, Hamas's control. And they don't consider Hamas to be Palestine. That they say is the Palestinian Authority sitting on the West Bank. They are willing to consider what the Palestinian Authority is saying, but they are not willing to think that Hamas is legitimate. And the idea is to eliminate Hamas if possible, and also uh, move all the Palestinians out of uh, Gaza and uh, push them into the West Bank where the Palestinian Authority is there. This is their ambition, but uh, it's not likely to happen because the world opinion is uh, not in favor of Israel, first of all. And even the Americans have started asking for a ceasefire on Gaza. And uh, they are even threatening to control export of uh, weapons and uh, uh, money to Israel to support the war. So this is the background in which where there is a lack of a <clears throat> global order or lack of a, a system which uh, controls issues. And that is basically because the United Nations has failed in all these four issues that I mentioned. The United Nations could not do anything. Earlier, they used to at least pass resolutions and there may be vetoes and things like that. Uh, but here, if a country, a veto-wielding country is attacking another member, is a member of the UN, then where is the law? And um, why is it that there was no cooperation at the time of COVID? Because the Security Council could not even meet because China was vetoing every resolution of the Security Council. And uh, so the whole situation in the world is such since the, um, the UN has reached its lowest ebb, you know, uh, total um, in incoherence and uh, in uh, act inaction. And so everybody is trying to, individuals are trying to conquer the world because they think that a new system will come, so we must prepare ourselves to dominate the world. China being the, in the forefront of that, pursuing expansionist policies. Uh, they were, they had occupied Indian territory before, but they always withdrew. But this time, there is no sign of withdrawal from several posts they have occupied. Something like uh, 1,000 kilometers of land they have occupied from India. And the uh, negotiations are not leading anywhere. So uh, the reason is this, that uh, in the absence of a world order, everyone expects to overtake the other and control the world. China particularly, United States countering it, uh, Russia flexing its muscles, we ourselves wanting to uh, gain strength and uh, increase our influence in the world. So that is why uh, nobody is an ally to anybody. Everyone is sort of waiting around, uh, hoping that uh, uh, something will emerge. And so uh, things happening in the world today has to be seen in this context of uh, unpredictability and absence of a, of a formula to deal with uh, security situations. And the UN Charter prescribes that it is the job of the Security Council uh, to um, secure international peace and security for everyone. But that is not happening because Security Council members themselves are involved or they are supporting others. Like US is vetoing everything for sake of Israel. And Russia can veto themselves, they can veto against uh, Ukraine or anybody else. And uh, as I mentioned, there was a, a point of a conflict between Israel and uh, Iran, which would have been a holocaust. It would have been a terrible uh, global war, but fortunately both were restrained. It was the middle of all this that uh, the uh, president of uh, Iran, Mr. Raisi, and his um, foreign minister, uh, who died in a helicopter crash in the Azerbaijan province of Iran. They were visiting Azerbaijan on their way back. They were still in the Azerbaijan province of Iran, but 
these three, three helicopters ran into rough weather, and two of them survived, but one in which both the president and the foreign minister were traveling crashed. So, first question is, why did they get into the same helicopter? And the uh, second question is, why this helicopter? It is more than 40 years old. And um, why is it being used even now? And particularly at a time when the United States has imposed sanctions. And they are not able to get spare parts or uh, technical know-how to maintain these helicopters. So how come they can't get helicopters or from China or Russia? Maybe they cannot get it from uh, the United States or Europe. But they could have done that. They should have acquired it. They are not a, a poor country. They are spending money on nuclear expansion, nuclear technology. Why can't they do buy neat planes for their own president and prime minister and others? So that is the first question, to which there is no answer. But the, Ameri but the Iranians are now focusing on that. They are saying that the responsibility for this is that of the United States and its sanctions. But why sanctions? Because the nuclear deal did not succeed. Uh, uh, President Trump withdrew from the nuclear Iran nuclear deal, and they have been negotiating ever since, and nothing has been nothing has been concluded, and uh, therefore the sanctions do exist, and Iranians cannot complain that sanctions are there if they don't sign a nuclear accord. So that was the first question being asked, but that's a neutral question because you cannot hit the Americans back for not giving them the spare parts. So people wanted to find another villain in the villain of the peace. And they readily uh, found a villain, which is Israel. And they started. No, Iran never said that, but all of us here, particularly here in this part of the world in Kerala, where there is a lot of sympathy for uh, Palestine and uh, Iran, uh, the question was, oh, is it uh, the Israeli security forces or... Uh, their uh, security, secret police or uh, whatever. And people started questioning everybody, each other. And my point was that this is just, uh, there's a saying in uh, in Kerala that if Kichakan is dead, uh, the, the murderer is Bhima. Nobody else could have killed him. So that is the only logic. If Israel is in trouble, then it has to be, sorry, if uh, Iran is in trouble, it must be Israel. Particularly because they were on the verge of a war just a few days ago. But there is no evidence of that. Iran itself is not making that charge. Iran is now saying that the villain is the United States and the sanctions. So that is out of the way. So it is not it is possible that after the investigation, they may come up with a new story. But Iran has said that they have no evidence that Israel has done this. And Israel itself has said that we are not uh, responsible for what happened. So thus, um, that, that is clear. There will be no war on account of this. But it will have implications because the man who got killed is not an ordinary man. The president is not the supreme power in, in Iran. It is Ayatollah Khamenei. And uh, he is the supreme leader and supreme ruler and he, he decides what happens. And he chose this particular president because he liked him. And he was at, the, at some time known as the butcher of Tehran, something like that, because he was um, in the judiciary. He was not a politician. He was a judge, and he was very harsh uh, with dissenting voices inside Iran. Many people were killed, and many people were tortured, arrested, etc., for raising their voice against the administration, against the theolo theologic, uh, uh, you know, kind of regime. And uh, he was the one, the president was the one, because of his judicial experience, uh, getting all these people punished and, uh, you know, people scared to death. And uh, so when he died, surprisingly, there was also some celebration in Iran of people who were affected by his dispensation of justice. And um, they, they felt that if he became the Ayatollah himself, which was likely because he was a favorite of uh, Khamenei. And uh, so people were afraid that this would be, lead to a big uh, problem. And so that was celebrated, at least among some people, uh, Iranians in Iran, and also many outside. 
you know, this Iranian descent uh, spreads all around the world. They have all run away from Iran during, first during the Iran, uh, Shah of Iran's time and later after the revolution. Many people have left uh, sizable communities in Europe and United States were originally from Iran, you know, saying that uh, if they go back to Iran, they will be persecuted. So, and these people do bring out stories from inside. And one of the famous stories that they built was about Iran's nuclear uh, intentions. Because Iran, um, you know, the first news that Iran, in, Iran is actually uh, building a bomb uh, was revealed by Iranian descent, uh, sending uh, people, Iranian citizens in Europe. That's how it came to the world, and the atomic, International Atomic Energy took charge of the thing and tried to investigate. And during the investigation, they found that there was some truth in what Iranians were doing, not necessarily making a bomb, uh, but enriching uranium. The Americans, President Bush had wanted uh, Iran to have a no, I mean, zero enrichment pro program. They have a nuclear program, but no enrichment. It should not be enriched beyond a point, not to make it into plutonium or to make weapons. Uh, but they didn't care about that. Uh, and uh, they, of course, had joined the NPT. Uh, so they could not do things like we did, you know, saying that we are not members of the NPT, so we are not bound by it. So we could do the course. We are also against with also sanctions against us, and big criticism after we exploded a bomb in 1998. When virtually the entire world turned against us, and we had to negotiate a nuclear deal with the United States to deal with this problem, and uh, uh, people declaring us a nuclear, um, you know, pariah, and, uh, not able to buy nuclear material and so on. And finally, of course, we signed the nuclear deal with the United States, which enabled us to do a few things like, you know, importing uranium and so on. But still, uh, we cannot join the nuclear suppliers group. Uh, we cannot get uh, uh, things like reactors from certain countries. Some countries are willing to sell us reactors. <laughs> the U.S. promised us six reactors, but that's not been built as yet. So the whole thing is... Uh, is a little bit in a, in a crisis situation. And Iran, they had signed an agreement with the United States that at least for 15 years, they will not make bombs. And uh, President Donald Trump came and said, why 15 years? It should be forever. And uh, when the Iranians refused, they, he walked out of it. And uh, you know, they are, uh, Iran is continuing to enrich their uh, uranium into nuclear weapon grade, and uh, when a time comes, they might experiment. Of course, they have issued a fatwa that is against nuclear weapons are against the instructions of God, and therefore we should not make it. And so there is a, an order from the supreme uh, leader of um, Iran that they will not make nuclear weapons. But that is not taken very seriously by the rest of the world. And uh, uh, there is a feeling that sooner or later they will go for the nuclear weapons in case there is a major threat. So if Israel, which has supposed to have nuclear weapons, threatens them with nuclear weapons, then uh, they have said, many leaders of Iran have said, at that time we will have no choice. Like in our case, we also were keeping uh, quiet. We had the first test in 74, but the second test we did only 24 years later. And that is because uh, we did not want to provoke the world into doing anything. And then the world was provoked, we were faced with sanctions, and it took us about 20 years to bring back some normalcy. But still, we are bound by not uh, producing a, a, a weapon. Uh, you know, it should be, we are saying that it will be only a deterrent and we will not build too much. And uh, also, we look at the various treaties and so on. But, but anyway, we are we're supposed to be a, a respectable, responsible uh, nuclear state. Uh, but uh, Iran is not like that because Iran is has signed the NPT, which means they have greater obligations. That as a signature NPT, they are not supposed to enrich uranium beyond a point. They are not supposed to keep 
plutonium in their uh, arsenals and they cannot enrich so much qualities of quality of uranium all these are some understanding and that is why uh, nobody has attacked iranian reactors uh, but they are certainly under sanction and that is creating a lot of problems for them and that is why uh, they say that the iranian uh, american sanctions have hurt them and uh, therefore uh, there is a reason for them to go nuclear well uh, whether the this uh, president's uh, uh, death will cause any uh, change in the situation is uh, being discussed and uh, mr kamene has said that uh, there will be no change change in the policy of uh, uh, the iranian government because of the death of uh, uh, president raisi um no, but that of course is uh, for the sake of form and nothing prevents him from finding out something more and the saying that yes this is now the time for us to go nuclear which will mean a huge situation particularly if mr trump is going to win the next elections in the united states so we have to uh, look at this question from that point of view as to whether the death of the president of iran will change the situation in the nuclear status of iran uh, there have been writings in the united states saying that there will be a change uh, because uh, when uh, this president is replaced the person who comes after him we won't know what kind of uh, uh, person he would be and um, the present government itself was on the verge of doing very many things for nuclear this thing and so Uh, when a new person comes will there be a change and uh, some american writers are writing that uh, there will be a change and the new president will uh, uh, certainly go for nuclear weapons with all this problems and therefore there will be no nuclear agreement for between iran and the western europe and the, and the united states so that throws a big issue into the into the ring and we have to watch and see how the situation develops uh, the other issue is since uh, mr raisi was some kind of a butcher and is supposed to have killed many people judicially and otherwise um, that question also arises if this have, leads to any kind of disturbance in uh, iran itself uh, you know those who don't like raisi makes noise or those who like raisi creates a situation like that and then how do you deal with it so will they use the same technique as mr raisi made you know oppressing and suppressing dissent or will he be more enlightened than the new president there is speculation about who will be the next president etc we don't know the situation so uh, and this is the other big difference that uh, this situation may cause is what iran will do with this right from now on. because today in the middle east there is no country which supports israel supports palestine as much as iran does so why did the hamas attack on october 7 because they felt that everybody is forgetting palestine even in g20 there was no reference to palestine earlier in international conferences there always be reference to palestine and so people were forgetting it because of all the accords reached between the arabs and israel and uh, another deal was in the offing between israel united states uh, uh, and uh, uh, others and therefore uh, there was a fear that uh, something else may happen and therefore they may uh, you know, suppress dissent and that may create uh, an instability that will happen that's one thing then the second is the palestinian losing hope that their f- best friend has lost its uh, strength and uh, they may go for serious things because at the moment the pressure is on israel to have declare a ceasefire but they are very unreasonable in not declaring a ceasefire and everybody the un security council has asked for a ceasefire and the united states have say, has said that uh, uh, they may uh, withdraw military support and financial support is well that this happens uh, so then 
what will what will Hamas do? Will they pursue their uh, you know ceasefire, or will they go to another aggressive terrorist attack? Uh, that's a big question. So all this have these international repercussions. Uh, coming to India is good news because uh, Prime, Prime Minister Modi has said that he had a personal equation with Mr. the, the president who, who just passed away, Mr. Raisi. And uh, the foreign minister was also very constructive towards India. And India has had not many problems with Iran in the past. We had a fairly cordial relations. And Iran always looked at us, at India's nuclear policy, to see whether they can imitate us. They cannot because they have signed the NPT. We have not signed the NPT. But still they think, oh, how lucky the Indians are. And uh, so they used to they used to ask me, how do you do these things? Why don't you let us know the secret so that we can also do the same thing? But ours was a different kind of approach. And um, so the, recently, because of the Taliban, and China's connections with Iran, and Iran becoming kind of a peacemaker in that region, uh, has had caused some problems to us because Iran is a close friend, but they were uh, wondering what to do with uh, India because of Taliban, etc. And so this Shabahar port, there was some uncertainty whether uh, Iran will take it away from us and give to China. But all these were settled just a few days before this man was killed, or sorry, was uh, hurt, uh, died in that air crash. And um, uh, so Mr. Modi was saying that sad that this man is gone. He declared one day's mourning in uh, India. So, which means that uh, we have reliable friends in Iran and we are not very bothered about that. Chawahar port also situation has been normalized and uh, you know, we are getting close to having diplomatic recognition of the Taliban in spite of all the atrocities that they are committing. So, all these are going on. Uh, but uh, we also don't expect a big change in our situation with service India. But then you cannot say how these things develop. And uh, there are dangers. And as against what I said about the 21st century becoming a century of uh, no ceasefire, no end of war, that kind of a situation. And that is why worrying and how we will the world will cope with this situation and bring about a new world order, like uh, revising the Security Council, admitting new me permanent members like India, Brazil, uh, Japan, uh, you know, and Germany, etc. Whether that will happen, or will the whole General United Nations collapse and we have a new United Nations? All is around the cards. Nobody knows what will happen. So into that uncertainty, we have also the situation in Iran. Uh, but I'm sure we are not going to go for a war at the moment. Although on the Taiwan, around Taiwan, you all know that a serious situation developing and the Chinese are doing exercises which appear to be war exercises, not just passing through or firing a warning shot, uh, but uh, they're actually practicing how to get onto the ground in Taiwan. That will be a very, very serious situation. Because the uh, United States cannot sit back, and they will certainly intervene, and then who else? Others will intervene. But as I said earlier, that was the best best news we heard from Iran recently. So there were th suspicion, worries, etc., about Chabahar port and our involvement in that. And uh, there was also some reports that uh, some railway construction, which India was supposed to do, they had handed it out to the Chinese. So whether the Chabahar port will also be given to the Chinese was a kind of uh, speculation. Uh, but we have requested the United States not to impose sanctions on the on account of Chabahar. Uh, because uh, it will be very useful for Afghanistan also, not only for us. Even for Afghanistan, the Taliban government will have some advantage. Not that the Americans love Taliban, uh, but uh, there is reason for Afghanistan to be rebuilt so that uh, the extreme conditions, extreme situation of the Taliban can change. Because at the moment, they are fighting for survival. Uh, but if we have relief, 
uh, and uh, also countries like India and others establishing diplomatic relations, uh, Taliban may return to, I mean, however hopeless that hope may be, uh, may, may return to normalcy and stop killing people and, uh, you know, suppressing women and all kinds of things. So, for the overall uh, situation in that region, maybe the Chabahar port run by India would be of use to everyone. And in that, maybe United States also has an interest not to have a conflict there. They fought 30, 30 years war and accomplished nothing. And so now through peace, can they establish something is something worthwhile. So that is the appeal that we have made to the Americans, not to make a song and dance about this, uh, but basically understand the logic of the communications and uh, the port. And uh, since India has been given this uh, uh, this port for to, to run, and uh, that'll be good for everybody in the region. Yeah, that's a valid question because even when the sanctions were at its height before the first nuclear deal with the United States, uh, we did not accept uh, any kind of sanctions against Iran. Uh, and uh, we continued to import because Americans were pressurizing us to reduce and we sometimes reduce, sometimes increase. But we had not accepted sanctions as they are in the case of Iran because it was not a UN sanction. If it's a UN sanction, we have no choice. But in, when it is imposed by one country, like the uh, restrictions imposed on Russia by European Union and the United States, it's not binding on everybody. It's only an appeal. And um, and therefore, we, we do buy from Russia. So similarly, we used to buy from Iran also. Uh, but uh, why we did not buy recently, I don't know what the economics of it is. And we have been saying repeatedly, our royal purchase will be basically determined by the price and availability and our, our need. So for that, maybe we have restricted it, particularly since we are getting so much oil from Russia uh, at a much better price. So maybe we have reduced our response, uh, dependence on Iran. But our problem is the Chinese intrusion into the whole region. And that is not restricted to one idea or one country. Taliban, they have completely lionized. Now they have very good relations with Iran. And uh, look at the um, Putin's visit into China, uh, which is a big uh, signal for us, because our best friend is going to be friends with our worst enemy. So where where do we go from there? Because the Russians were never neutral in the case of India-China, at least. But they were not against. They were trying even the latest incidents. They tried to organize some meetings, etc. So. But they always believe that the brother is stronger than the friend. And in this case, we know who the brother is and who is the friend. So for India, it is not a good news, but uh, uh, we have survived. And um, this new relationship is really serious. I think that will uh, create a lot of issues for us. Uh, but then again, we are hoping that we'll be able to deal with it through peaceful means. And uh, our... Uh, you know, most towards Taliban also is related to this. That if uh, some of these things are beneficial to both the Taliban, Afghanistan, and us, and others, uh, maybe, you know, Americans will not make a, a big issue of it. But uh, we have been, of course, but we are buying it only according to the needs. We are not uh, provoking anybody. Uh, but wherever we could get prices in control, control manner and without any restrictions we have been importing from Iran. We have no, it's not untouchable for us. Yes, India was the one country which kept out of BRI completely. No other country had uh, completely boycotted uh, BRI. And the reason was simple. We knew very well that this is part of Chinese domination of the world all roads leading to Beijing, etc. So, but that we cannot say. And therefore, we said this is because the CPEC is pa passing through Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. And that is a violation of our sovereignty. That was the reason we gave why we were accepting uh, BRI, not accepting BRI. And of course, nobody believed that. 
and uh, we they even refused because at one point we even told the chinese that in case you divert this track uh, from pakistan occupied kashmir we may be able to consider joining in the informal talks we were saying but they refused so that means for them going through pok was as important as having bri and india understood it some thinkers in india suggested that if we didn't do that we will be isolated somebody compared india to a you know traffic policeman right standing in the middle of the road and trying to control the traffic and the traffic goes its own way you know the bri will go left right and center and india will be in the middle of it but that is changed now people have realized that this was a uh, hoax you know sri lankan case everybody knows and uh, they were dumping what they did not want in these poor countries and uh, trying to make use of excess material and excess uh, labor in order to win friends and uh, abroad that was the objective of bri and now several countries have back backed out of bri they found that this was a debt debt trap and um, they, they may have to pay very heavily for this and so uh, the we don't need to do anything about uh, BRI to die, die a natural death, but as long as China has so much resources, funding, and they're um, you know keen to dominate the world, so they may pursue it in one way or the other. But it doesn't have the kind of uh, support it had initially of many countries joining and thinking that this is part this is the way to uh, develop the, their countries. So that has changed. 